Well, a great good morning to you, Mr. Carr. Good morning. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Oh, peace, peace. Peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. <clears throat> so welcome to our first gathering face to face since this uh, pandemic, except for the time that we gathered last year on the 4th of July. We're hoping that we can continue to sustain this face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, it's very satisfactory, of course. It is, as I said earlier, a meeting of old friends. And so, May we be able to sustain it. That said, of course, if you are coming here, it is expected that you will be fully vaccinated. And uh, when appropriate, uh, we request that you wear a mask. I have a mask with me as soon as I'm down from here and finish talking, I will put that mask on. So just a few announcements. Of course, we're very pleased to know that Swami Sarvadevananda, uh, our head minister, who of course is stationed in Hollywood at the Hollywood campus of the Vedanta Society of Southern California, will be here for a visit. He's changed the dates slightly he will arrive on the 16th and uh, he'll be here in the evening, but there he only has one meeting scheduled for that evening, the 16th. <clears throat> and then he'll be here on the 17th and the 18th. On the 17th, he'll have meetings with devotees, uh, especially a meeting with those who are to be initiated on the afternoon of the 17th. Uh, we'll establish that time and let everyone know uh, that meeting will be exclusively for those who are, to, who are to be initiated the next morning, the 18th. And then the Swami will leave early in the morning on the 19th. He won't be available uh, on the 19th. So though he will be here from the 16th to the 19th, his real availability is on the 17th and on the 18th. So we'll be scheduling meetings for those of you who wish to meet with him on those days. <clears throat> I am very, very happy to say that we had a real good crowd yesterday for Save Us Saturday, a very good crowd, and a tremendous amount was accomplished. For example, the patio that we have been working on uh, bit by bit over the winter was finished yesterday. Uh, it isn't all furnished yet, but the patio itself is finished. You can go look out 
under the oak tree that is closest to the monastery, the tall oak tree, and see a beautiful circular patio and the tables that uh, uh, are were made to go on that uh, patio are there. The chairs, we have two chairs, they're not out there yet. Anyway, there's more to be done in terms of details, but the patio itself is finished and much other work was done here yesterday. A good deal of weeding, cleanup and so on. So the center does look very nice indeed. And our lawn care people will be here this next week to <clears throat> bring the lawn into conformance with expectations. Next Sunday, speaking from this chair, if we can manage the Zoom aspect of it, will be our dear friend, Gareth Young who is a transmitted, that is, ordained Buddhist teacher. He received that uh, ordination, that transmission last September. He's been working toward it for years. <clears throat> and he will speak to us on the topic, not knowing, not knowing. He'll speak from here next week. Are there any announcements that I might have made or should have made? Yes, Cindy. Um, next Sunday, you, you said something about if you can get the Zoom, are you going to, because I'm not going to be here. No, I know that we're working uh, on either Jyoti or Aaron doing it. Oh, okay. Sitting exactly where you are right now okay. with the same kind of setup. Okay. So. I just didn't know. Well, thank you very much for bringing it up. So last month, in the month of April, we studied Raja Yoga. This month, we're taking up Jnana Yoga. Raja Yoga is the yoga of meditation. Jnana Yoga, the yoga of philosophy. And just this caveat. Nothing that is said this morning is meant as personal instruction for you. This is information for you, for you to take and use as you see fit, if at all. It is a different frame of reference, very different frame of reference from the Raja Yoga that we studied last month, and then in June, we will take up Bhakti Yoga. Each of these yogas is a different frame of reference, a different workbook, if you will. The workbook or workbooks for Advaita Vedanta or Jnana Yoga are Vashishta's teachings to Rama, the Vashishta Yoga, and Adi Shankaracharya, and other later uh, formulators of the, of the uh, philosophy, including, of course, Swami Vivekananda. So here's a definition, a brief definition of Jnana Yoga. May will be a month for the study of Jnana Yoga and Voita Vedanta, as a jnana yogi, you practice discrimination, reason, detachment, and satyagraha, insistence on truth, capital T, truth, insistence on truth. The goal is freedom from limitation, moksha. Our teachers say that all miseries in life are caused by seeing inaccurately an earnest and persistent jnani may break through this misapprehension, which in Sanskrit is called maya, an earnest and persistent jnani 
may break through this misapprehension, Maya, and see only the divine presence everywhere, in everything, and in everyone. Now this morning, since we're starting the study of jnana, we're going to include Swami, uh, not Swami, Sri Ramakrishna's expansion of this idea, which he called Vigyana. And in Vigyana, you see the divine presence everywhere in everything and in everyone. A jnani may take the attitude that all of Maya is simply a dream and set it aside, focusing strictly on the Brahman aspect, the actionless aspect. Swami Sri Ramakrishna says, no, that which is in action, that which appears to be a dream, is also real, is also Brahman. He says water still, Brahman inactive, or water in waves is the same water. Water in waves, of course, is the universe we understand and know. Water in waves. So the question this morning that we're posing is, if consciousness is not plural, what then are you? Swami Yogeshananda, founder of our center, told his students, <clears throat> consciousness is primary and is not plural. If consciousness is not plural, what then are you indeed? Answers to this question will be offered this morning. Some will be familiar and with a different frame of reference. Others may be surprising. There will be quotes from Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, Vivekananda, and Toltec wisdom as taught by the Yaqui Indian master, Don Juan Matus will be mentioned. Poems by St. Teresa of Avila and Walt Whitman will be read. And as always, there will be time to hear what you have to say, address your concerns, and answer questions. So as I said, we're going to start with Sri Ramakrishna's Vigyana, that which he said is beyond simple, knowledge of truth, the truth of Brahman. Vigyana means special knowledge. But to introduce this entire topic, we'll read a portion of a poem by St. Teresa of Avila. This is from her poem, Every Prophet's Name. <clears throat> I found completeness when each breath, I found completeness when each breath began to silently say the name of the Lord. That name, my conception of him, extended to me a hand that led to a place which, where even his divine name did not exist. Why? Most sounds express discontent, longing, or negotiation. The teapot may whistle out an ecstatic cry, but even that I learned to control until everything I knew built, burst in a glorious symmetry. I have no seams, no walls, 
no laws. My frontiers and gods are the same. One divine being is existence. All the forests on the earth combined are but a tiny wood, a tiny word, a tiny fragment, a particle of the spoke on the wheel. What is the relationship of the form to the unseen aspects of God? What percentage of God is unseen? What percentage of the truth of him do we know? He led me to a place where only light exists. Only in us is God so lost that he asks questions. How old do you think is existence? So this leads us to a frame of reference. How old do you think is existence? Here is the beginning as a metaphor of the night and the day of Brahma. Night, total entropy, the unmanifest and the potential for manifestation. Brahman, Maya, Purusha, Prakriti, and the Gunas are in perfect equilibrium. No form, no name. Total entropy, the unmanifest as potential for manifestation. The day of Brahma, something happens. In the Chandogya Upanishad is the phrase Hiranyagarbha. In Sankhya, there is the term Mahat, the gunas out of equilibrium. Subtle preparation of form to come, then name. So this is what the, this metaphor of the night no manifestation, Brahman alone exists, and then this idea that something happens within the cosmic mind and the potential for all of the manifestation that we know is generated. It's natural, it's eternal, it's always there. Sometimes it's in equilibrium, sometimes not. Now, what is the Western Judeo-Christian idea? This is from the New American Standard Bible about the creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waves, the waves being the disequilibrium of creation of heaven and earth. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. If you want to find full exposition of this creation myth and some others, uh, I'll recommend a book. It's called Memories and Visions of Paradise. It's a wonderfully researched and very thorough exploration and definition of these uh, memories and visions of paradise. It's written by a man named Richard Heinberg. You can find his talk to the uh, Theosophical Society uh, in Los Angeles on YouTube. Beautiful talk. In that light of creation, what are we? If all this comes into being, what are, comes into being, what are we? This is from Sri Ramakrishna, and the, it's in the gospel. It's the beginning of chapter 33. 
Sunday, October 26th, 1884. It was afternoon and many devotees were present in the master's room. Among them were Manomaha, Manomohan, Mahimacharan, and M, the writer of the gospel. They were joined later by Ishan and Hazra. Babaram and Rakal were still staying in Vrindavan. The, the many young boys who at this time began to seek the master's company later became his intimate disciples and many of them became the Ramakrishna order. Latu, Latu Maharaj, later Swami Adbhutananda, lived with the master and Yogan, later Swami Yogananda, who lived, and Yogan, who lived in the village, was a frequent visitor. <clears throat> so this just sets the scene for us. What was it like? There were a number of people in the room, the master was there. Sri Ramakrishna, happy child of the Divine Mother that he was, radiated a joy and peace that reflected in the hearts of the devotees and found expression in their happy faces. They were seated on the floor and their eyes fixed on the master who was standing in a pensive mood like a boy. Master to Manamohan, I see Rama in all beings. You are all sitting there, but I see only Rama in every one of you. I'll repeat that. I see Rama in all things. You are sitting there, but I see only Rama in every one of you. Mano Mohan. Yes, sir, it is Rama who has become everything. But as you say, though all water is Narayana, some water is fit for drinking, some for washing hands and faces, and some only for cleaning pots and pans. Master, it is true, but I see it is all God. It is all God who, it is true, but I see it is God himself who has become everything, the universe and all its living beings. This is Vigyana. Everything is the divine. Yes, there is that still aspect, that night of Brahma, Brahman alone and one only one, not plural. Hmm? But then there's the universe what is it i see that it is god himself who has become everything the universe and its living beings this is beyond jnana vijnana that special knowledge in patanjali's yoga sutras chapter 2 sutra 21 i think it says the object of experience the universe serves only uh, a, the object of experience, the universe exists only to serve the purpose of the Atma. That is the Sutra. The object of experience, the universe exists only to serve the purpose of the Atma. That implies there is a purpose. We'll explore what that purpose is. The truth of your being is that you are that Atman, Tatvamasi, that thou art, both as mother's physical child and the self, the witness, dwelling within your stardust spacesuit. And the secret then becomes that you as that divine being and the purpose that is spoken of, you want this to happen. You want 
this universe to exist. And you want to be here this morning for reasons of your very own, perfect reasons, perfect reasons. In a perfect universe, it is all of the creation of the divine for its own purpose. From the Chandogya Upanishad, although I am one, I shall become many. Although I am one, I shall become many. This is a one translation of a verse from the Chandogya Upanishad. The divine feminine, the mother of the universe, is now and for all time giving birth to those many. What does that mean? Here's a story by Sri Sharada Devi, Holy Mother. A disciple was with her and said, Mother, why are we the way we are? And why is the universe the way it is? And Mother said, well, child, let me tell you a story. The first time God, that is to say her mind-born son, Brahma, the first time God created the universe, he endowed human beings only with goodness. And so they soon realized that this was all a chimera, chimera, a, a magic show. It wasn't in any sense eternally real. It would come and go. And so they prayed in that knowledge, with that knowledge, they prayed to be released. And they did. They were. And so the universe collapsed. Brahma then said to himself, hmm, these are mother words, these are mother's words now. Brahma then said to himself, hmm, this is not how to make them play the game, the game of being many. And so the second time he created the universe, he endowed human beings not only with goodness, sattva, but with profuse quantities of materialism and vanity, tamas and rajas. So now we have a universe of beings endowed with slightly more of the revealing power, sattva, and these two other objects, object-related attributes, tamas, materialism, and vanity, rajas. Tamas is the concealing power, rajas the projecting power. Now, how does this correlate with the Judeo-Christian idea of creation. There is a very tidy correlation. You can also see this in relationship to the yugas in the Vedic tradition. In this first creation, or the Satyu, God created human beings but they were essentially passive. They didn't do anything. They were simply with the divine. They weren't playing the game of many. They were, as I said, essentially passive, content. And God said to himself, hmm, 
This is not how to make them play the game. And so he created something called the tree of the knowledge of the fruits of good and evil. And he forbade them to partake of this tree. Now, what do we know about forbidding people to do things? Don't think of the monkey. What will you think of? Nothing but the monkey. The monkey, the monkey, the monkey. So, of course, being omniscient, God knew perfectly well that they would partake of the duality, of the knowledge of good and evil. And so then the game as we know it begins. You can now see the Silver Age, the Age of Rum. Hmm? No longer the Golden Age in which everything is perfection. There is now imperfection. Cain slew Abel. Hmm? And all this that goes along in the Judeo-Christian tradition. So these are all the, the things that are part of these creation myths and how it ties together that the divine being in cooperation with its own creation in cooperation with and for purposes then of all our own creates the universe we now exist in. We've now, of course, come down to the Kali Yuga, the last of the four Yugas, where things are dark indeed. The darkness is thin. It can be easily penetrated by spiritual practice but it is very much there. So what do we hear about this that we have created from Sri Ramakrishna's spokesperson, Swami Vivekananda? <clears throat> this is from his talk, The Real and the Apparent Man. What the dualist says is true says the says the Advoitin. What the dualist says is true, says the Advoitin, but it is simply of his own making. It's true, but it's of his own making. These spheres and devils and gunas and reincarnations and transmigrations are all mythology. So also is this human life. The great mistake that men always make is that they think that this life alone is true. They understand it well enough when other things are called mythologies, but are never willing to do the same of their own position the dualistic position. The whole thing, as it appears, is mere mythology. And the greatest of all lies is that we are bodies, that we, which we never were, nor even can be. It is the greatest of all lies that we are merely men. We are the God of the universe. In worshiping God, we have always been worshiping our own hidden self. So how, how does this, how does this limitation come on us? How does this limitation of this dualistic point of view and our insistence that it is a truth, when in fact it is a myth, according to Vivekananda. It is mythology. Well, listen to this from Don Juan Matus. This is from Carlos Castaneda's book, Journey to Islam. 
Castaneda wrote, I must first explain Don Juan's basic premise as he presented it to me. He said that for a brujo, an accomplished yogi, we can, a, a yogic adept, that's how we can translate brujo. For a brujo, the world of everyday life is not real, not out there as we believe it is. He, hmm. for a brujo, reality or the world as we know it is only a description, a description that has been pounded into me from the moment I was born. He pointed out that everyone who comes into contact with a child is a teacher who incessantly describes the world to the child. From the moment that child is capable of perceiving the world, it is described. From that moment on, he No, from that moment on, the child is a member. He knows the description of the world and his membership becomes full-fledged when he is capable of making all the proper perceptual interpretations, which by conforming to that description, we validated, which by conforming to that description validated. For Don Juan, then, the reality of our day-to-day -day existence consists of an endless flow of perceptual interpretations which we have learned to make in common, which is the very definition of a myth, beliefs held in common. The reality of our day-to-day -day life consists of an endless flow of perceptual interpretations, which we have learned to make in common. Don Juan taught his apprentices how to overcome that description, how to free themselves from the entrapment of their inherited membership. He called this entrap, he called this achievement, this overcoming their membership. He called this achievement stopping the world. What becomes of us when we can do that? When we're no longer prisoners of the membership that was pounded into us from the time we were a child. This is from Walt, Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. I highly recommend reading this to every one of you. Walt Whitman was what Swami Vivekananda referred to as the great American sannyasi. This is from his poem, Song of Myself. Houses and rooms are full of perfumes. The shelves are crowded with perfumes. I breathe the fragrance myself and know it and like it. This distillation would intoxicate me also, but I shall not let it. Have you reckoned a thousand acres much? Have you reckoned the earth much? Have you practiced so long to read? Have you felt so proud to get at the meaning of poems? Stop this day and night with me and you shall possess the origin of all, of all poems. You shall possess the good of the earth and sun. There are millions of suns left. You shall no longer take things at second or third hands, or look through the eyes of the dead, nor feed on the specters in books. You shall, you shall not look through my eyes either, nor take things from me. 
You shall not look through my eyes either, nor take things from me. You shall listen to all sides and then filter them from yourself. Trippers and askers surround me, people I meet, the effect upon me of my entire life or the world and city I live in or the nation, the latest dates, discoveries, inventions, societies, authors old and new, my dinner dress, associates, looks, compliments, dues, the real or fancied indifference of some man or woman I love, the sickness of one of my folks or of myself, or ill doing or loss or lack of money or depressions, exaltations, battles, the horrors of fratricidal war, the fever of doubtful news, the, the fitful events. These come to me days and nights and go from me again. They are not the me myself. Apart from the pulling and hauling stands what I am. But they are not the me myself. Apart from the pulling and hauling stands what I am. Stands amused, complacent, compassionating, <coughs> idle, unitary, looks down, is erect, or bends an arm on, him, on an impalpable, certain rest, looking with side-curved head, curious what will become next, both in and out of the game, and watching and wondering at it. Backward I see in my own days where I sweated through fog with linguists and contenders. I have no mocking or arguments. I witness and wait. Okay, let's hear from you here in the room or from you on Zoom. What does this give rise to in you? This definition of what we are if consciousness is not blue. Yes, dear. I just wanted to comment. I think it's interesting that Walt, Walt Whitman said in he's both in and out of the game. And earlier we have, you know, it's like he knew. <laughs> yes, yes. Both in and out of the game. But it is not me myself. Brother Shankara. Yes, please, Frank. <laughs> Um, I have two questions about something you were talking about a little earlier about um, Genesis, how you compared it with um, God had created one universe, and but everyone knew who they were. So it wasn't really going as planned. So he let them, made them forget it. And uh, then you had said with Genesis that he, God knew, uh, Genesis interpretation was that God saw it wasn't going to plan. So he created the tree of good and evil. And he said, don't eat this, you know, but God knows everything. So he knew they were going to eat it. My two questions is if God knows everything, then didn't God know or realize that the first creation was not going to go as planned? <laughs> well, 
trying to be funny. No, no, I wasn't trying to be sarcastic. I'm, I'm being sincere. I wasn't. You know it's I, a great question. I understand your, your uh, apparently according to mother's story, Brahma being within time, space and causation, though he is her mind born son, he is also a created being. And so has partakes to some degree in our ignorance. She knows everything and might well have known she, the Divine Mother, might know everything. But that which she creates through her gunas, including her mind-born son, uh, Brahma and Vishnu or was it Shiva? No, I think it was Brahma and Vishnu. Got into some contest with one another, and Brahma actually lied to, to Vishnu about something. This is the story in the Vedas, in the Upanishads. So that which is within creation partakes of its ignorance. That's the only answer that I can come up with, Frank, as to this very sincere, and I understand it's a sincere question. She may have known that if he did it that way, it wasn't going to work. So what was the second question? Um, with the, the fruit of good and evil, if God wanted them to do it and know they were gonna do it, instead of saying, don't do it, why didn't God just say, here, manja, and either you will have the knowledge or don't tell them about it. Like, why, did, why didn't God just say, eat it and you'll have knowledge or just not say anything and let them eat it? Why did God specifically, or why did the Bible uh, put it in a way that God specifically said, don't eat it? Uh, the only thing I can think of, Frank, in response to that question is that if he had done it the second two ways that you describe, they would have incurred no karma. The karma would have been his. And so the karma would not have, that karma of doing, of disobeying, becomes a cause that creates the effects that are described in Genesis. The garden is lost to them. And now they must work. Now they must sweat. Now they will contend with one another and they will finally become what is destroyed in Noah's flood, and so on, and some of the rest of the stories in Genesis. There, there has to be karma, there has to be action. This is, we're told, this realm that we inhabit is the karma bumi. It is the field of action. And most specifically, our Stardust spacesuit bodies are the field of action and the field of karma. And this is why Krishna is at such pains in, in chapter four, five, and six of the Gita to explain to us how we can escape back into that situation whereby we are not bound by our karma. The, the Stardust spacesuits will continue to experience karma. But we, as the witness, the, di the divine being, will not experience the karma. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, those are very good questions, Frank, as always. And I never doubt your sincerity. I, sometimes I know you're being funny, but uh, I, I never doubt your sincerity. What good questions? Anything else from anyone? Shaka? Yes. Um, but that story stood out for me too. And I, I found it, I took it as a really wonderful uh, teaching story because so often in the Christian faith, especially the way I grew up and I'm sure many others, the idea of original sin is pounded into us in such a way that, you know, we become sort of psychologically bound to it and act out of that throughout our lives. So yes. I think. The beauty of this story, um, for me, it was more of a fable 
that allows us to see it just as you described it as karmic and not as something uh, that we have to carry on our hearts and souls throughout life. So I, I, that's how I took it. Yes, original sin is the ignorance in which we are into which we are born. That is the original sin. Orig sin simply means missing the mark. Doesn't mean bad and wrong. But I think often the disobedience, it was the disobedience, right? right. We are sort of um, right. um, becomes the, the ball and chain, right? right. That we were, not that we were um, fulfilling our destiny in a way, but that we were, or not that we were eliminating ignorance, but that we were disobedience. Oh, yes. Yeah. Are, are we not disobedient? Are we not disobedient now? Of course we are. We're disobedient to it. Is it that we're incurring any displeasure? No, it's not the point. If there weren't the ignorance, the universe could not exist. It exists because of this ignorance that is produced by the three gunas. Remember, all three gunas are known as the robbers. <coughs> Even sattva, the revealing power, will leave us, oh, I'm content. <laughs> I'll let my house go to ruin. I won't tend to my family. I'm, 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 I know the truth, and so I'm just content, and I'll just rock along. Well, Sri Ramakrishna says, fie on that. You know, that too is a robbery because you stop pursuing your freedom. You think, oh, I'm free enough. <laughs> I'm free enough. I know stuff, so I'm free enough. Thank you, Julian. Yes, and I too was raised with that on one side of the family, uh, on the, with my mother's mother and Bob Taylor, that was never an issue. Anything else from anybody? I have a comment. Yes, Tom, please. So the way I think of these stories is sort of like myths and fables that have more to do with the human psyche than the external universe. Uh, like, I don't think there was a, an actual physical garden of Eden and a tree and Adam and Eve and a snake. I don't think those actually physically existed on earth, but I think that those things exist inside of me as states mm -hmm. of mind of the Eden. I don't want to try to go into just exactly what all this stuff symbolizes, because first, I don't know uh, and secondly, uh, it might vary from person to person, but I mean, I can feel Eden within myself and then I can feel leaving the Eden, uh, which has to do with the tree of, of good and not good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil and so on. And the same with the story about Brahma, uh, you know, creating the perfect universe. I really haven't I've heard that story before, but I haven't thought nearly as much about it as I've thought of about the Garden of Eden story. So I, I can't say what I think it symbolizes, but I think it's more symbolic than literally true. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tom. And yes, of course, these are all just descriptions of something that is absolutely beyond description. Beyond description. Carlos Castaneda, in a very funny part of the book, Teachings of Don Juan, he's trying to pin down Don Juan as to, you know, the accuracy of what he's telling him. And Don Juan finally loses patience, loses patience with him. He says, damn it, Carlos, this is only a way of talking about it. This is just a way of talking about it. You can't really say what it is. Then he says, learn to stop the world and you'll see it. <laughs> and of course, Castaneda has no idea at that point what this means. And I'm not sure that I know at this point what it means either. What is behind it? What 
but certainly I do have the idea of what it means to stop the world. This relentless delusion that was pounded into us as children, as Castaneda says, as no nonsense. Uh, <clears throat> yes, dear. I was about to say something which you said right now. Uh, it's like <clears throat> this world, as it is, mixture of good and evil qualities, mm -hmm. divine and divine. And if that is what it is, given, this is jnana, we know it, we perceive it, we interpret it, we try to comment on it as we see it. But the way Ramakrishna explained that when you learn to see only him or her, God, Goddess, in everything, then it becomes Vigyan, spatial. Mm -hmm. So that I understand. <laughs> but my personal interpretation <coughs> about the story, the Bible story, is that all talking, all knowledge, and you may be master of what you know, but until the action begins, it's not coming alive. And also in all our uh, stage presentations, action. Yes. Once there is action, the yes. fun begins. Ah, <laughs> and yes. all work and no play makes Jack or Jill, whatever, dull boy. Yes. So in order to cre create that element of interest, of fun, God took a second chance and we did. Right. But last point I want to make that Bhagavad Gita is an excellent uh, way whoever wrote it, Vyas or whoever, balance, balance of these gunas which are not desirable versus other gunas yes. which are desirable. Yes. And it said balance sukha dukha same krutva so when it say I give combination of the two, then it becomes a what we shall say advanced spiritual state of mind. Yes. Very, very true. Very true. Thank you. All right. Anything else from anyone? Brother Shankara? Yes, Frank. I just wanted to uh, really thank Tom for what he shared. Um, that really helped because after he spoke about that, um, I sat with it quickly and just said, wow, that's really cool. It's an analogy that paradise, that Garden of Eden is within me whether I choose to stay there or not. That yes. the serpent is me, how I tempt myself. That the Eve is within me, how I do or don't obey my highest self. And the Adam is within me on how I allow myself to be blindly led. So it, it just, it, it really helped. So I just wanted to thank him uh, yes. very much for that. That, that really, Sometimes I take things too literal. So I, I just wanted to thank him for sharing. I got a lot out of that. Well, good. And, and we thank Tom as well. And thank you for saying that. Thank you. And so, yes, indeed. We have nothing but this clumsy language to deal with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mathematicians did their best to create an infallible language, a language that when you knew how to read it, perfectly expressed the truths and elegantly expressed the truths that they were trying to say. And yet John Dobson said, even they will fudge their math. 
and make it lie. Even they will do that. And that's just outraged them. Oh, mm -hmm. it just outraged them. But of course it's true. So is there anything else from anyone? I've heard some yogis say that the kundalini or that the serpent represents the kundalini energy, which can be harnessed as, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, Vivekananda says that the, indeed that serpent that is spoken of in the Garden of Eden story is the kundalini, yes. And that it, that it, uh, it arose and caused the human psyche to become entranced with duality by itself becoming entranced with duality yes he's, he mentions that so yes the kundalini energy is the energy that creates the manifestation i mean it creates the five koshas the five the five sheaths of this this body. So yes, you're right, Ramanas. And there's more. You can look in Vivekananda's complete works and uh, just read what he has to say about Kundalini here and there. Just you know, just do a search on Kundalini, and you'll find that among other very interesting uh, observations on the Kundalini, but particularly in his six lessons. On, on Raja Yoga, how to harness the power of the Kundalini, which he says don't do unless you have a qualified teacher. Anything more? Yes, dear. Yes. So, this idea of, of calling this creation a game and all this, so um, I feel like I can understand what is being said but i have a problem uh, with this model so isn't this um, way uh, so calling it a game but then it's also this ignorance is also the reason that uh, many of us suffer right like uh, say some there are sections of people that who don't have access to certain things and so on but so isn't the ignorance part or this um, you know this way of having both good and evil the reason for the sufferings as well oh of course and first of all there's no as i said at the very beginning there's no reason for you to accept any of this as a as a model as you say that is that is the definition of the truth there is no definition of the truth that is completely un unexceptionally <coughs> accurate so there's absolutely no reason that you must accept this it's not dumb it is a way of talking about it and yes you're absolutely right it is our primordial ignorance which is born with the manifestation itself Maya is the illusion that something is happening. And one of the best descriptions that you will find, you will find very interesting information in chapters two through seven of the Gita, or throughout the Gita for that matter, but, but then specifically in, I believe it's chapter 13, which is titled The Field and Its Knower. Shetra, Shetra. Yes. So if you read Bhagavad Gita chapter 13, the field and its known, <clears throat> you will see Krishna's description of this karma bhumi, who's who and what's what and why it is happening. We'll take that up when we study karma yoga again. But, the, you know, the, these are all various explanations. All four of the yogas as taught by Vivekananda, work, worship, psychic control or philosophy. Take one or more or, or all of these 
use one or more or all of these and be free. Free of what? Free of the delusion. Free of the delusion that you are anything but the divinity. Each soul is potentially divine. The goal of human life is to manifest this divinity. So each of these yogas has its own workbook. Work, actually the Gita is the best workbook on karma yoga. Of course, Swami Vivekananda delivered a, some, a group of lectures on karma yoga that brings it into the, a more modern context for us, but it's essentially the same information. So the great workbook for karma yoga is the Gita itself. For bhakti yoga, of course, there is the Narada's bhakti sutras, which are unparalleled in their, if you think bhakti is an easy path, just read Narada's bhakti sutras. It's, it's, it's a very rigorous path if you're going to practice it without sentimentality. The workbook for Raja Yoga, of course, the most well-known and most commented upon is Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And then the workbook for uh, Jnana Yoga or Advaita, probably the best known, is Adi Shankaracharya's Viveka Chudamani, Crest Jewel of Discrimination. There's also uh, that wonderful book that was produced by Swami Sarvadevananda that is called Nectar of Supreme Knowledge. It's the distillation of the 30,000 sutras of Vashishta's teachings to Rama into just a few, maybe 60 some odd. And they were translated uh, into Bengali by a realized soul. So, so he was, it was said to be a member of the Ramakrishna order who lived in the Amalias. He translated those into Bengali for the, for the order. And Swami Sarvadevananda undertook to translate that Bengali into English and publish it as the book Nectar of Supreme Knowledge, which is available in our bookshop. It's a beautiful book. And it's uh, the book itself says, read this three times with diligence and doing your manana and nididyasana, and you will become a realized soul. That's what it says on the flat out. So if that ain't a work, workbook, I don't know what is. So these are the workbooks for these various explanations of what this reality that appears to us is, how we participate in it, and how to free ourselves from that participation when it becomes our desire to do so. Anything else from anyone? This is wonderful. Thank you, Naraj. There's yes. um, Shanti, who does not have a microphone, um, has a question. Yes. Um, do we take on karma if being in the Leela, the play, we know we are, aka we know we are doing our dharma as an actor in the play, be it a thief or other role that society damns? If, as long as the I consciousness is predominant, as long as I feel I am doing it, then the karma adheres to both the, 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 the spacesuit itself and the psyche behind it, but never to the Atman. The Atman has no karma. If you wish to be free of the karma, Sri Krishna explains very carefully in chapters four, five, six, and seven of, how, of the Gita, how to be free of the karma. Mm -hmm. And essentially, to summarize it, he says, live sacramentally. Offer everything, 
everything without exception to me, and I'll take the karma. And so it will not adhere either to your stardust spacesuit or to your psyche. So karma continues to adhere to the, the body and the mind behind the body as long as that mind and body think that they are the ones who are doing. And does, and ask Shanti, does that answer the question for her? <laughs> She says yes. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Okay. Um, I think uh, the first action that consciousness is not plural, it's one. So, from what I heard, am I understanding right? that to see that unity in the entire diversity and to <clears throat> identify yourself with every little or big lie or even inanimate creation of the world is to have that consciousness of oneness of our consciousness that we not different we may have all the appearance of our bodies of our circumstances of our nationality of our language whatever whatever differences a galore but to see within all that 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 in a sense of who we are. Yes. That is what is. Yes. Awareness. As, as I believe it was St. Thomas Aquinas said, uh, when you slash someone with a sword, you may not know it, but you bleed. Yeah. And what does Sri Krishna say? about who is among the most dear to him yeah. those who suffer the sufferings mm -hmm. and share the exaltations mm -hmm. of all beings mm -hmm. yeah. not just suffer the sufferings but share the exaltations what does that mean it means that you are a compassionate mm -hmm. towards someone com truly compassionate towards someone who is suffering, anyone or anything, any being. His mother said, I suffer for an ant. I share the sufferings of an ant. But the exaltations, why does he mention that? Because so many of us, instead of being able to exalt with others, we say, oh, what? They got a new car? Our car is five years old. How are we going to get a new car? Instead of saying, oh, they got a wonderful new car. Hey, Charlie, show me all the wonderful things about your new car. I mean, that's just a tiny, tiny little example. But jealousy, envy, and all of that, instead of being able to insult <laughs> with others. Doesn't it take long, long practice and at an advanced stage? that kind of thinking, it takes time. It well, of course it does, it's of course it does. But <laughs> yeah. can, it can be done according to every one of the teachers that we pay attention to. It can be done in this lifetime. You do not have to wait for another lifetime. And this is why there's four yogas are there and the whole idea of taking refuge and the avatars is there because they can share their spiritual achievements with you. This is why the idea of guru is there. 
because the guru can pass along to you the spiritual power it comes down through apostolic succession and so on yes dear i i feel like you know you, you can perhaps reach that sort of state of being compassionate and you know also joyous with people's happy stuff through through different practices real spiritual practices and whatnot but i also think it's that to have that with on the both side on both sides the joyous part and the suffering part is more of a world view oh, yes. than i mean you can do it as actions like oh these poor little puppies that are homeless or whatever mm -hmm. um but oh but jealous i think that that isn't because you're not practicing it's it's that your worldview hasn't isn't there you're absolutely and that there right. are people who are born that way yes. with that sensitivity to others like there isn't really a whole lot of separation between me and the tree out there or the mm -hmm. you know yep. the ant exactly there's no two ways about it and this of course is why Patanjali's Yoga Sutra starts with the Yamas and Niyamas. Yeah. We have to do away, if we're born with that self-centered point of view, what, how is this going to affect me? What is, what is the effect on me? Me, 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 I, me, mine. You have to replace that slowly and slowly with the idea of thou, thee, thine. So if you're not born with that word, you somehow find your way to that worldview. Swami Shivananda Mahapurush Maharaj, one of Swami of, of Sri Ramakrishna's direct disciples, said, well, I said the open secret is there's a simpler way than all that work. He says, simply find a way to install God in your heart and then all those virtues and attributes that we associate with the divine will spontaneously manifest in you. Spontaneously manifest. Mm -hmm. You don't have to work at it. What you have to work at is mm -hmm. installing the divine presence. Or actually, Sri Ramakrishna says it's more of a recognition that the divine presence already has made his or her drawing room in your heart. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but you, you don't know it. So yes. it's more of a recognition. Focus is yes. focus. Ah, that's exactly Next. that's exactly what Goethe was pointing at. You know, the masculine pronoun is there, but it's, it's the meaning is very clear. A man sees in the world what he carries in his heart. Exactly. <coughs> Anything else from anyone? Yes, Professor. Yes, please. Going back to the uh, like the world, uh, like the second time when the God created the world, so yes. that it doesn't dissolve. So at that time, we we were also given certain kind of freedom along with it, right? Like so, in order that the world doesn't dissolve. So I think in uh, in Guru Maharaj, one of the story he tells like we have a freedom like. If a bull is tied to the center of the pole and it has a freedom, so it can roam around, but it doesn't have full freedom. So like that, we were given some freedom along with that, so that this world can continue, and we were like people can have the freedom of doing whatever things they want to do, but the karma gets associated along with that, so that and then like it doesn't. Uh, I mean, like the aim is like not to have karma, so that you you doesn't come back again to this world. And we also know that like we are part of the God and <coughs> at the same time, we also hear in many of the uh, talks or things like that uh, you have to make it as your own, like the God and you, you have this, like you are God, but you have to make it as your own, like, so you need to work it out, something like that. And that's what I was, all these thoughts were. Uh, well, <clears throat> yes, to go to your first point about free will. Sri Ramakrishna says free will, the idea of free will exists only as long as I consciousness exists. And to the extent that you feel like I am the one who is being, I am the one who is doing, 
I am the one who is thinking, I am the one who is acting, then there is this idea of free will. I have the freedom to do these things. And of course, with that free will comes the other side, the karmic debt that is associated with that. So each effect becomes a new cause and, and, the, and the chain then is endless until it is broken. It's broken by one of these four yogas that, uh, that was mentioned earlier. But of course, the, the idea, the thing we have to remember, though, always remember about karma and all of this doing and acting and so on. We want it to happen. We as the divine being, this is the purpose we have set out. I am one, I shall become many. And according to the Vedas and according to the modern cosmologists, they come up approximately with the same number. The length of this doing and being is 110 billion years, 110 B billion years. We are 13.7 billion years into that cycle, according to the cosmologists. But that doesn't mean we can't stop the world and stop this process of reincarnation at any time. We can say, this is a mythology in which I no longer believe. using Vivekananda's metaphor of it being a commonly held belief, a mythology. I don't believe this mythology that I was taught. I believe something else, and the implications of that are, and so on. But yes, the karma goes on as long as we have the sense of I am doing this as long as the I comes first. As soon as the thou begins to come first, mm -hmm. then things change. But as Swami Sri Dharananda said, we start with the feeling quite naturally and quite legitimately, I am. Of course, who's going to sit here and deny it? then something happens in those people who are awakening and they say mm, I am and thou art and after a while if they pursue that by whatever method they come to the feeling thou art and therefore I am and the, the, the I am becomes much smaller than the feeling of thou art. And ultimately, the, the final goal is the recognition, the realization, thou art. And that the, the I am was nothing more than a myth, an idea. What is that song? Everything is you, and you are everything. I don't know that song. <laughs> Sounds like I should know that song. I'd like to know that song. I have two little bits that I'd like to read before we finish. One is from Ken Wilbur. This first is from his book, uh, The Mystic Vision. The mystical Writings of the World's Great Physicists by Ken Wilber. The plurality that we perceive is only an appearance. It is not real. Vedantic philosophy, it has, Vedantic philosophy has sought to clarify it by a number of analogies. One of the most attractive being the many-faceted crystal which 
while showing hundreds of little pictures of what is in reality a single existent, ob existent object does not really multiply the object. The plurality that we perceive is only an appearance. It is not real. Vedantic philosophy has sought to clarify it by a number of analogies, one of the most attractive being the many-faceted crystal, which while showing hundreds of little pictures of what is in reality a single existent object does not really multiply that object. The mystic vision, as uh, it's in the book, um, Quantum Questions, Mystical Writings of the World's Great Physicist, uh, edited by Ken Wilbur. And the last is this, from the writings of, uh, this is from life of the life of Erwin Schrodinger, one of the great uh, quantum physicists. No self is of itself alone. It has a long chain of intellectual ancestors. The I is chained to ancestry by many factors. There is no more, this is no mere allegory, but an eternal memory. The stages of human development are, the stages of human development to strive for are possession, knowledge, ability, being. And this is, this is exactly, exactly what Swami Ranganathananda outlines in his talk titled Divine Grace. Exactly that. So this is something that was said by Erwin Schrodinger. So with that, if there's no further comment or question from anyone, let there be peace in outer space. Let there be peace in outer space. Let there be peace in the sky, on the earth, and in the waters. Let there be peace on the sky, on the earth, and in the waters. Let there be peace in the herbs, the plants, and the trees. May the gods be peaceful. May the gods be peaceful. May the whole universe be pervaded by peace. Let this infinite universal peace prevail throughout my being. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beings everywhere. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai Durga Durga Durga. May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind. May we go forward in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. And now, now for those of you who uh, are uh, here with us, there is some food to be had inside, as is our usual way of doing. Please join us inside for a little bit, and uh, we'll be uh, we'll kind of keep our distance from one another a little bit so that there is safety. But uh, there is definitely that wondrous uh, fellowship that we can enjoy. Bhagirat, how are you, dear? I'm doing quite all right. Good, good, good. I'm so glad. Yes. yes. So glad. And how are you? I'm doing the same. 
After a particular age, you cannot have an asymptomatic body. No, you simply cannot. But that's okay. Well, it's, it, it's, it has to be okay. Though. And that symptom itself is a sign of life. Yes. 